So hello everybody again and welcome to the 21st and final ICAP webinar. It's a great honor to have Dom Chosky with us today. Dom is the founder of Modern Linguistics, one of the most cited scholars in modern history and one of the most influential public intellectuals in the world. Today's webinar is entitled Doom to Extinction, Reflection on Sunset of Humanity and the New Dawn. I would like to ask you a question right away that maybe Noam can address at the end of his talk. So here it is. During and following World War I, Sigmund Freud wrote about the opposition between the life drive, Eros, and the self-destructive death instinct, Thanatos. Within this context, the very same survival of humanity so far is proof that the life drive is stronger than the death drive. Still, humanity has entered a new era of high extinction risk. The sixth mass extinction is ongoing and climate change related disasters are becoming more visible. Tipping points, extreme weather, spreading of new diseases, and on top of this, a renovated risk of nuclear war. So the question is, uh, Will our life drive be enough this time as well? Or is this time different? And therefore, humanity needs to achieve a higher awareness level to survive. And if this is the case, what would be the path toward this higher awareness? Without further ado, Noam, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'd like to begin with an event that raised very sharply the question that we are now considering. Are we doomed to extinction? Are our days on earth the sunset of humanity? The event, as you probably guessed, took place on August 6th, 1945, a day that I remember very well. Uh, I happened to be then a counselor at a summer camp. The announcement came in the morning that uh, an atom bomb had destroyed the city of Hiroshima. Everybody clapped, went off to their next activity, swimming, baseball, whatever could be. Well, there were two lessons there. One was that human intelligence had ascended or maybe descended to the stage where it was capable or it would soon be capable of wiping out everything. That was one lesson. Second lesson was nobody cared. That posed a crucial question. There is plainly a gap between our technical capacity to destroy and our moral capacity to control that death wish. And the question is, can that gap be, over, can that gap be overcome? If not, we're doomed and in short order. I didn't know it then, no one, no one did, but the question was also being raised in a different form. The late 1940s are now recognized as the beginning of a new geological epoch, what geologists call the Anthropocene an epoch in which human society, human activity has an overwhelming effect on the environment. This sharply accelerates the devastation that has been proceeding since the Industrial Revolution, tracing back even earlier. In this connection, the same question arises. Can we overcome the gap between our technical capacity 
to destroy the environment that saves, sustains life and our moral capacity to save ourselves and the millions of other species that we are wantonly destroying as the sixth extinction proceeds. If not, we will be heading towards a gruesome sunset of humanity. In both cases, there could be a new dawn. The nuclear age can be ended by elimination of the scourge of nuclear weapons. Even short of that, the awesome threat can be mitigated by devices that are well within our reach, like reinstating the arms control regime that has been dismantled by the Bush and Trump administrations in the United States, and then moving on to improve them. Another way to mitigate the threat is by establishing nuclear weapons free zones throughout the world, or more accurately, by allowing them to function. They do cover much of the world, but they cannot function because of US insistence on violating them. That's a point for us to crucially bear in mind. In the most important case, the Middle East, they cannot be established because the United States and the United States alone prevents it. These are very important issues, rarely if ever discussed, can return to them if you like. In any event, there is a straightforward way to mitigate, even to eliminate the nuclear threat. The second threat, the threat of climate destruction and the sixth extinction is harder to deal with but the basic issue is the same. There are feasible means to bring the crisis under control and to move towards a much more livable world. The most detailed work on this matter has been done by my friend, co-author Robert Pollan and his research group. They have developed detailed plans that are well within reach. And they have also gone on to direct activism to implement such proposals with considerable success, even in some of the hardest places like coal country in West Virginia. But the gap between technical and moral capacity remains, and in fact is widening. There is a simple measure of the gap, the doomsday clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Set in 1947, the hand, certain distance, minute hand, that time, seven minutes to midnight, Midnight means termination. The closest the clock has come to midnight was in 1953, two minutes to midnight. That was when the United States and the Soviet Union uh, set off thermonuclear weapons, which do have the capacity to destroy everything. Well, since that time, the minute hand of the clock has oscillated, depending on assessment of world conditions. It didn't return to two minutes to midnight until the Trump administration. By the end of the Trump administration, the analysts had abandoned minutes, shifted to seconds. It's now set at 100 seconds to midnight. Next January, it will be said again, strong case can be made that it's the second hand should be moved
closer to issue to midnight termination. The analysts identify three major issues that lead to these conclusions. Uh, first issue is the inability to contain the threat of nuclear weapons, which in fact is now growing significantly. The second is the failure to deal with the existential threat of, of environmental destruction. And the third issue is the decline, the serious decline of an arena of rational discourse where these issues can be discussed sensibly, solutions can be evaluated and implemented. That's very serious. Unless that gap is overcome, uh, we in fact are doomed. Uh, unless these three issues are resolved, nothing else matters. Organized human life on earth will be finished. We will continue to bring down with us most of the rest of life. Uh, beetles and bacteria will probably do well, filling the niches that we are opening up as we destroy everything else. The situation is dire. It's becoming worse. The Ukraine invasion, which is quite reasonably occupying most attention, has made it far worse. The circumstances in Ukraine itself are awful. Don't have to review that. But there are much broader consequences. The worst can only be avoided by diplomacy, which might have averted the catastrophe in the first place if it had been seriously pursued. And while the criminal invasion limit reduce the options, they still exist. I won't review the record here. I can return if you like. But the basic fact is that the United States has been opposed to democracy, to diplomacy, and it is committed now to the rejection of diplomacy. What that entails is that the United States and NATO with it are conducting a ghastly experiment. They're prolonging the war to weaken Russia. And the experiment is, let's see if President Putin will slink away quietly in total defeat or whether he will use the weapons that we all know he has to devastate Ukraine. That is the experiment to which the United States and NATO are committed. The goal is to weaken Russia. This was made explicit a few weeks ago at a meeting that the United States called of the NATO powers not in Brussels, the headquarters of NATO, but in the Ramstein Air Base in Germany, US Air Base. That was to make it clear who's the boss. The United States is giving the orders. The goal of the prolongation of the war is to harm Russia. Uh, they are quite explicitly uh, using what's called the Afghan model of the 1980s. The US reaction to the Russian invasion of Afghanistan. Well, since that's the model that's now being pursued by Washington with NATO in tow, we might look, look at that model. We can now do it. There is a definitive careful study of the Afghan model by Diego 
Cordovez, the UN ambassador who carried, who in fact implemented the withdrawal and Zelik Harrison, a fine a scholar and a journalist who covered it closely. Uh, they recently published a book which uh, in detail describes what happens. Their analysis completely overthrows the standard version. They demonstrate that the war was ended, the Russian withdrawal was implemented thanks to careful UN run diplomacy, not by military force. Soviet military forces were fully capable of continuing the war, quite stable. They also had a relatively popular government in place, the Najibullah government, uh, which was carrying out progressive measures, defending women's rights in the urban areas they controlled and so on. Uh, the government in fact held out for three years uh, after the Russians left. Withdrawal, they did finally leave. Withdrawal had been delayed for years by US efforts to prolong the war by mobilizing and funding, funding the most extremist radical Islamists they could find around the world to fight the Russians. The policy Cordovas and Harrison say was fighting the war to the last Afghan. Describe it as a proxy war to weaken the Soviet Union. To quote their conclusion, the United States did its best to prevent the emergence of a UN role, the careful diplomatic efforts that did end the war and arrange the withdrawal. Well, if that sounds like something that's happening today, there's a reason it is. The facts don't disappear because the media and the political class are unified in suppressing them to a degree that is quite remarkable. Well, nevertheless, NATO is not completely unified. The leaders of France, Germany, and Italy are seeking to move towards negotiations to end the war soon. The US and Britain are seeking to drag it out. These matters are discussed, but at the margins, and very few are aware of the facts. The consequences go far beyond Ukraine. If the war continues, millions of people are likely to die from starvation all throughout the Middle East, Africa, and Asia. They rely heavily on food export from the Black Sea region, which is a major region of export. Ukrainian ports are now blocked, blockaded by the Russian Navy, preventing the export of desperately needed food. The US reaction is to send anti-ship missiles to Ukraine to try to destroy the ships and force Russia to stop the blockade of ports. Uh, Moscow, has a different proposal, but in our increasingly totalitarian culture, it cannot be reported. So I'll quote it. Moscow, I'm quoting it from a report in antiwar.com. That's a very good, very reliable libertarian site. I'll quote it. Moscow has offered a diplomatic solution to the Black Sea standoff. On Thursday, last Thursday, the Kremlin proposed lifting the blockade in exchange for sanctions relief. The Russian foreign ministry said the problem goes beyond the blockade 
and includes Western sanctions restricting fertilizer exports. You have to not only appeal to the Russian Federation, but also look deeply at the whole complex of reasons that caused the food crisis. Sanctions interfere with normal free trade encompassing food products, including wheat, fertilizer, and others. So let's move to a diplomatic solution. Well, these facts are correct. The terrible food crisis has broader roots in the Black Sea region. Coming back to the United States and Britain, we must starve millions of people in order to harm Russia. Gets worse. Another consequence of the invasion of Ukraine is the reversal of limited efforts to deal with the climate catastrophe. There were such efforts underway. They have now been totally reversed. Now the effort is to maximize the use of fossil fuels, including the most destructive of them, eliminate the measures to mitigate the crises. Uh, can easily understand the euphoria in the offices of the major oil fossil fuel producers. Now they can rid themselves of these annoying environmentalists and instead they're being lauded for racing as quickly as possible to destroy the prospects for human survival. That's what's happening before our eyes. South Asia, Middle East, much of Africa will become unlivable. And in fact, if current trends persist, it won't be worth living, even if you can survive. A third consequence of the nuclear, of the Ukraine invasion, broader consequence, is that the threat of nuclear war is increasing. It's easy to think of chains of escalation. So suppose, for example, that the anti-ship missiles that the United States is sending to Ukraine uh, sink the Russian Navy, as Ukraine claims they intend to do. Is Russia going to sit by quietly and say, that was nice, or are they going to react? If they react, they're in a confrontation with NATO. We're often running on to a nuclear war. Uh, the US and Western commentators have been somewhat surprised, as they've explained, by the fact that Russia has so far limited its attack. Now, they expect that sooner or later, Russia will begin to attack the supply lines that are uh, you being used to send heavy weapons into Ukraine. Do that, another confrontation with NATO, we're off and running. Uh, the chain of escalation is easy to imagine. So the threat of nuclear war, climate destruction are increasing, and there's a very severe threat of massive starvation millions dying. All of this is quite apart from the horrible destruction in Ukraine itself. All of this must continue, according to Britain and the United States, in order to harm Russia. Well, there's another dimension of a different character, namely the restructuring of world order. Throughout the whole Cold War, there have been competing visions of the role of Europe. One vision is what's called the Atlanticist vision implemented by NATO. The Europe should be subordinate to the United States as was 
clearly indicated by the meeting in the Rammstein Air Base a few weeks ago. That's one vision, the one that has in fact prevailed. There has been an alternative expressed most clearly by Charles de Gaulle. Uh, there should be, as he put it, a Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals uh, with uh, no military alliances. In Germany, since Willy Brandt, it's been called Ostpolitik, moving to make step-by-step -step accommodations with Russia, very beneficial to the whole region, commercial relations, security relations, and so on. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, this was put forth by Mikhail Gorbachev in an even broader form. He called for a common European home from Lisbon to Vladivostok, no military alliances, just commercial, cultural relations and accommodation. What he called a common European home. Well, that's uh, uh, the effect of the invasion was uh, the invasion from was not only criminal, it was also from Russia's point of view, extraordinarily stupid. What it did is establish very clearly the, uh, the Atlanticist version. Europe was driven into Washington's pocket more deeply than ever before, by now even Sweden and Finland. So we're seeing what we're seeing develop is a, uh, an international order, which on one hand is Europe, the English speaking countries, maybe Japan, that's one block. The other block is China-based with Russia becoming a subordinate to the Chinese dominated system. Russia is a fading kleptocracy, but uh, is a huge raw materials producer. China will be happy to get Russian raw materials on favorable terms. And Russia is also capable of producing advanced weapons. Now that's the international order. The Chinese space system is meanwhile, while all this is happening, is being steadily expanded, expanded through the Belt and Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road Initiative, the, under the auspices of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, includes all of Central Asia with development programs, uh, infrastructure programs, loans, uh, uh, leading to the uh, Middle East, United Arab Emirates through the Maritime Silk Road, even reaching to Israel, reaching into Africa with similar programs, even Latin America. That's the China-based, huge China-based system. The other system is the US dominated uh, system, including Europe and the English speaking countries. That's the world that we're facing and the threats in the China region of nuclear war are very extreme. Can go into that. Meanwhile, new alliances are developing, which we should pay attention to within this framework. One of them is taking shape in Budapest and Hungary. The American conservative movement, the conservative political action conference is the star, uh, the main participant in the Budapest conference. Uh, this is a gathering of the far right in Europe, the parties with neo-fascist origins, along with the core of the Republican Party. 
in November, the Republican Party will presumably take over Congress uh, that uh, will extend this US-Hungary alliance, an alliance of what are called, what call themselves illiberal democracies, racist, repressive. Uh, they will probably link up with the Abraham Alliance, the one geostrategic accomplishment of the Trump administration. It linked together the most reactionary and repressive states in the uh, MENA, Middle East, North African region, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, Saudi Arabia in the background, the Egyptian dictatorship already part of it, uh, reaching to Moroccan, Morocco, the Moroccan dictatorship, uh, which the US authorized its illegal invasion of Western Sahara, along with the illegal uh, Israeli annexations and invasions of the occupied territories. Well, that's the Abraham Alliance will doubtly uh, link to the new uh, uh, reactionary alliance being formed right now in the Budapest meetings. Uh, Hungary and Israel already have close a close alliance. Uh, they have common values racist, repressive, they're both opposed by European Union liberalism, which they dismiss, and they're both acceptable, in fact, supported by the United States. So more generally, what's taking shape is an international alliance of reactionary states run from Washington, the Abraham Alliance, Modi's India, crushing Indian secular democracy, instituting a, a, a Hindu ethnoc uh, ethnocracy. It's uh, conquering Kashmir, violently crushing independence. Uh, it's a very natural member of the Washington-based alliance. And uh, what's taking place in Orban's Hungary Europe, like it or not, being drawn into it. Well, these processes are likely to be accelerated in a few months if the Republican Party takes Congress. That seems likely. Perhaps even the presidency, relying on their very public efforts, not at all concealed, to restrict the vote, uh, to simply overturn election results at the state level if they don't like them. Well, without continuing, it's all too easy to paint an ugly picture and it's worth doing. We have to see what might come about and what we must work hard to prevent. Can be done for every problem we face, however severe, there are feasible answers. A couple of weeks ago, the World Social Forum had its annual meeting, more than 20 years. It forcefully reiterated its slogan, another world is possible. That is correct, another world is possible, but it won't come into being without hard, dedicated work. Thank you.